This is Zeiss Presents Full Exposure, the weekly resource for news, trends, and the people who influence the world of photography and cinematography. Hosted by veteran photographer and filmmaker Jim Camp. On this episode of Full Exposure, we're back in New York on location for the Photo Plus Expo, part two. Today on the final installment of Full Exposure from Photo Plus in New York, we'll speak with various Zeiss experts about their latest release, the Bodice 40mm F2 Close Focus, as well as get some cool background on the history of Zeiss Lens grouping design and how this remains relevant today, over 100 years since being introduced. I'm Tony Wisniewski. I'm the marketing manager for the Americas for Carl Zeiss Camera Lens Division. Hey, Tony. Thanks for joining us. Uh, give My us an uh, overview of... Uh, what Zeiss is uh, showing at the expo, and um, you know what's their new hot equipment that everybody's talking right. about. I'm glad you asked. We've been talking a lot about the new bodice lens, the uh, F2 40 close focus. Um, it really, what it does is it really plugs a hole, if you would, in the in the bodice line and gives it a full complement of prime focal length lenses um, that lend themselves not only to high speed uh, focusing for events or, or fast moving uh, photography, but also they, they're great to work with the Sony cameras for, um, for yeah. autofocus video applications, whether you're shooting a, vi uh, a wedding or you know, going down and shooting your kids at the soccer at the soccer field, those lenses are going to keep up with the ability of a, of a high speed video application. So what we've really got now is we've got full complements of families: the Otis high end lens, the Milvis uh, lenses for Canon and Nikon, the Bodice uh, autofocus for Sony, as well as the Loxia, uh, which is a manual focus for the Sony that gives an excellent uh, uh, cinematic look to what you're trying to capture, be it photography or video. You mentioned something about, uh, I think you called it future proofing. Explain right. what that, how they, uh, how they sort of can project that, you know, in, in, you know, technologically and so on. Great. Glad you asked. Um, Zeiss often looks to when we're designing things and thinking about not only how people will be using it now, but what's coming in the future. Um, and we see it now, but back in the day, uh, most people were saying, oh, a Super 35 or a crop sensor is going to be good enough. And you saw that especially in the cinema lines. And, and Zeiss decided that we would cover all the bases and made a majority, if not all, of our lenses um, to be full frame sensor coverage. Fast forward to today, um, you've got the Alexa LF in the cinema line, you have the Sony Venice camera, they're all full frame. You've got full frame across the spectrum in all of the cameras that are being produced for photography and videography. And Zeiss lenses are ready to go with all of them. You don't need to wait for something new to come from us. We already have it available for you. And so that's what we do to try and make sure that we keep everything ready for you. And once you buy a Zeiss lens, it's going to work for you in the future, irrespective of what camera you put it on. Is there anything that you could talk about uh, as far as you know, what you look at to competitors and what you think that Zeiss does differently than competitors, direct competitors. Right. There, um, a lot of what you will hear from people who are Zeiss users or Zeiss fans is it has a look. There's the Zeiss look. And this is something that we didn't come up with, but people brought to us and said, you know, I don't know what it is, man, but it looks different. What that is actually, and what it's been described as, as a depth to the imagery. The Zeiss lenses give that much clarity and micro contrast, what we call it. Um, so it's the ability to lift some different aspects of the depth of the picture off of the off of the page, uh, and it really gives it a 3D look, even though you're in a 2D plane. And that's irrespective of the bokeh that you might be putting into it. It just gives it a nice crisp clarity to the imagery that you see, and it really pops your your subject matter to the forefront of your of your focus plane. Yeah, I mean, uh, we were speaking with uh, Snehal earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, talking about the specifics of the cine lenses compared with you know some of the lenses that might look like they're still lenses but uh, actually have a cross purpose um, can you talk about that a little sure. bit? Sure. Zeiss has a long history of, of design, of engineering concepts for the different designs of lenses. So you'll see that in some of the things we do. One of the ones that are, that, that's the bread and butter for us is called a distagon. The lenses used to have that name. What it really is is it's the engineering concept of the lens stack within the, the lens housing itself. And it's made for specific applications. And that's really what we're doing. We're using those applications to apply them to the way that those lenses 
lenses are intended to use. Certainly a bodice lens, which might employ a Distagon design for a, uh, a Sony, is going to look a lot different than a Supreme Prime lens, which may also be a Distagon design, but is meant for a highly cinematic, cinematic uh, full feature film uh, look. So that we design with intent in mind on how these are going to be used, and how our users have been telling us that they want to apply the lens to their craft. What do you think's coming? You're saying you're talking Ooh, about future, future proving. What's coming in the, you know, what might we see next year, right. the next show? I think you're already seeing it. Um, you know, Canon and Nikon have brought out their mirrorless applications, their new cameras. And what you're seeing is very high megapixel um, um, sensors. That's great, and I think that they're going to continue to, to push the, the element there, uh, push the envelope in bringing more and more capability to the sensor and, and, and getting a, a higher density of pixels on it. What that means, though, is that your lens has to keep up. Your lens now has to be very yeah. accurate to be able to get the light to that sensor and let the sensor use it correctly, um, You know, minimizing aberration and distortion that might be apparent in some older style lenses. And that's what I think you're going to see uh, Zeiss really coming out in, in, into full bloom, certainly with the Otis lenses, which marry with those, those greater density um, uh, sensors with a much better optics. And really, you need better optics to make sure these sensors are doing exactly what you've asked them to do. Well, we look forward to new and exciting announcements possibly coming in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us and talking about it. My pleasure. We caught up with Dr. Michael Pullman, product manager for Zeiss's bodice line of lenses, for some theory on lens design and reasoning for selecting the 40 millimeter focal length in particular. Hi Michael, thanks for joining us. Tell us about your uh, responsibilities at Zeiss and a little bit about the history of lens design and maybe how that affects current lenses. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm a category manager at Zeiss. I'm responsible for all the still photography lenses uh, that means I'm designing or concepting the lenses, uh, which then we will bring to the market. Uh, regarding the, the historical aspect, so we are manufacturing lenses, designing lenses since more than 120 years. Uh, so there's a whole lot of experience in that. Um, when we are today designing a lens, uh, the design can still be led back to uh, lens designs which have been done 1903, 1906 for the first times. Of course, they have evolved, but still uh, the, the physical background, you can lead back to these old designs which have been invented by employees of uh, the Zeiss company. And uh, I mean, you see, still see it today, that we are measuring uh, our lens designs eh, yeah, on our lenses like uh, planar, Tessa, Distagon, Biogon. So they all have different aspects, uh, different characteristics, which yeah, are, are dependent on the focal length, the lens type. You choose different lens designs. So do, do, those, uh, do those names, Biogon, Planar, Distagon, do they, the, the current names, do they have any kind of re, uh, optical design relationship to the original lenses somehow? That's exactly the way. It is, uh, it is more or less the, the how to say, uh, the lens groups, how, how they are, the, more or less the optical power refraction of the lens groups, that really can be led back to the, to the very early designs. Uh, so whether it's a, a planar, a very highly symmetrical design uh, before and after the aperture, or whether it's a distagon, a retrofocus uh, design where you have a, a big uh, distance between the last lens surface and the sensor, which is yeah, very suitable for, for, for example, for uh, SLR uh, lenses. So this, these still can be led back, and that's really done every, with every new lens design. We, we compare it with these old designs and, and, and look where they are fitting best to. That is so cool. Um, so that would lead me to ask you about current lens design and creating lenses for specific customer groups. How, how does that work when you 
actually uh, uh, target different customer groups for the different lines of lenses. Yeah. That's extremely important to take into account. I mean, it's really the focal length, but especially also the aperture of a lens that really changes the use case or might change the use case. A higher aperture, a faster lens would mean it gets bigger, it gets heavier, and of course, it would change the, the user who would be interested in that. So that's also the reason why we have different product families which, uh, which have different characteristics. Because we think, yeah, you can't do just one lens or one lens family for all the different types of photographers. Right. Some people would be much less inclined to one of 135 f2 than a 135 28. <laughs> That, that's that's right, but that's exactly uh, that's an ongoing yeah discussion during the development of such a lens. So whom are we targeting to uh, to who sh yeah who is who would use this lens? Uh, is he more focused on a lightweight system on a small system, or is he looking for? the most shallow depth of field, and that really then is the decision to go for f2, f2.8. Um, someone mentioned to me, you know, how important it is for uh, customer success, but that seems like a very hard thing to quantify. How do you quantify meeting customer success? To be honest, that's nearly impossible to have it quantified. Uh, but it is, of course, uh, a qualitative thing. It's, it's really qualitative. As you have a very broad range of different users, uh, therefore looking for different, I would say, uh, they have different requirements, uh, and it's, it's very gradual changing. Uh, but it is, it is clear that, uh, that you have to have a specific target in order yeah, that, that this, it is not a lens where you try to make everyone happy because that's not possible at all. Uh, well, a lot of people are talking about the 40 that's just shipping now. A lot of people we've spoken with at the show, yeah. a lot of photographers are anticipating it. Tell us about the inspiration for that lens, the one you're holding in your hand. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, the Batis 240 close focus, that's the, our newest lens for the Batis family, and that's a very good example for this question you just had about designing a lens. Um, we, we had this decision to take what aperture, what maximum aperture, what speed we should go for, and here it was really, we had the intention to make a very versatile lens, uh, and, and so, therefore we, we have chosen the F2, because you, you have a very shallow depth of field, but it still is in a reasonable size. If we would have gone faster, then the lens would have gone heavier, larger, and that's no longer a lens you, you would carry around all day long, and in every trip you are taking. Uh, and and that's, that's maybe one perfect example for, for these considerations you have to make when designing a lens. Also, yeah, one functionality here is this close focus. So that was very important to us. Uh, not only this 40 millimeter as a very uh, uh, focal length with a very broad range of applications, but you normally miss the very detailed shots, the very short focus distances, and we wanted to have it included in this 40 millimeter lens. And that also sort of, um, it kind of goes with the design for uh, the small mirrorless cameras versus DSLRs and so forth. Yeah, yeah, th that was, well, that's one key direction of this Bartis family, so that there is a very nice and good balance to the camera body size-wise, weight-wise, uh, because that's still one of the big advantages of mirrorless, uh, that you can be, uh, yeah, have a smaller and lighter system. Well, I, let's talk about, just for a brief minute in closing, something about uh, service. Uh, maybe a lot of people don't think about size for service, uh, but 
tell us a little about, about the service that you guys offer? Yeah, so we offer worldwide service. We have service centers worldwide. Uh, we, we have a, a typical hotline, although in our case it's very special as we have real photographers behind the hotline, so it's not first level, second level, third level support, it's just one level. Uh, so by, by contacting our hotline, you get really to the guys who, who you could discuss with details of the lenses. But as you already somehow mentioned, uh, that's more or less this customer interaction. The other part of the service is, of course, if you have a problem with your lens, then of course you can send it into our worldwide uh, service centers. But normally, or that's one of our, our priorities, that you don't have to contact the service center because of any problems with your lens. So normally the customer doesn't need any contact to our service departments. Because the manufacturing quality is? That, that it is outstanding. <laughs> no, it's really, that's really one of the key aspects. That's really something also we take into account during the design, looking at the manufacturing tolerance from the very beginning. That's also our quality limits we need during production to, to be fulfilled in order that the lenses are that good, that there is no discussion needed or no disappointment on the customer side. So good, we have good service, but you're not going to need the service very often, right? That, that's right, and th that's, that's really the way we, we target it, yes, right. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much for talking to us. You are welcome, you're welcome, thank you. Then, we had a few words with Snehal Patel, the LA-based expert on cinema lenses and applications, to talk about how Zeiss Cine lenses have influenced the latest in hybrid lenses. Hi, Snehal, can you introduce yourself and uh, what you do at Zeiss? Oh, hi, Jim. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I'm the cinema sales manager for North and South America for Zeiss. So my responsibilities as a specialist in cinema is to handle the market when it comes to our cinema lenses or the application of our still lenses for video shooting or cinema applications. So it includes everything from compact primes to supreme primes in the cinema line, but also the use of our manual focus lenses for video applications like the Loxia, the Milvis, and the Otis. Well, that's a perfect introduction because we're hearing a lot about the cross-use, the so-called hybridization of lenses. And so tell us a little bit about how Zeiss addresses that in their line. Well, you know, Zeiss has been addressing this since 2009, quite honestly, because we used to have the ZE and ZF primes lenses, right, for Canon and Nikon, and they were very, very popular. And part of the reason they were really, really popular is because people used them for video applications. In the early days of the DSLR cameras, your 5Ds and your 7D cameras from Canon really drove that market, and we had a high-quality manual focus lens that could be used, because you can, you know and from cinema lenses, you have to have a manual focus, you generally have a manual iris, but you have to be able to turn that barrel slowly so that when your actor moves, you know, you can move with them and if you have very short throws like you do in a lot of autofocus lenses it's not very conducive to filmmaking so you know we now have a new generation of lenses that you know this is the successor to the ZEZF primes that I mentioned which is the Milvis and the Milvis is a very very nice manual focus lens it does have an electronic iris if it's the Canon version but you can get the Nikon version with an iris that could be manual or automatic so the nice thing is is that you're able to it has a long throw, and we're able to modify the lens slightly by adding a lens gear. So we can add a lens gear that can go around the lens. Whoops, that's the wrong side. That is so cool. And what this lens gear does is that it gives you the same 0.8 pitch gears that you see on my cinema lens. So the cinema lens here, and you see these will mash up right next to each other, and you can see it's the same pitch, the same type of gearing, and this is a solid metal ring. And by adding this ring to your, your photo lens, you then are able to cinevise it and you have a cinema application for it. And because you have the long focus throws on our manual focus lenses, it is conducive to exactly what you want for cinematic applications. It's really, really cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's as easy as taking it apart like this and you slip it on and then you tighten it and that's it. And actually the nice thing is with this gear ring on it, you can actually use the lens with a manual focus, 
like a, um, you know, a, sorry, a manual follow focus, like a mechanical one, or you can use an electronic follow focus. Because a lot of times nowadays you're going to see applications like on drones or handheld with motors and people using a remote follow focus system. And this system actually works with both which you don't see with a lot of the plastic gears that are out for this, you know, for this application. So obviously, it goes without saying, but obviously when they design the lens, the action of the lens has to be able to mesh with a mechanic, with an electro, electronic follow focus. So some of the lenses are, probably the action's a little too stiff, so, you know, other lenses, you know, from other manufacturers, or some of those right. old still lenses. Right, or they're continuously fo uh, spinning, right? So if they're an autofocus right. lens, right. What, what good is it to put a gear on? You don't have any end stops, so it becomes very difficult exactly, to use. Yeah. And it's impossible to use with an electronic system a lot of times unless you manually stop it. So the nice thing about this is that it works with existing systems, and the optical quality of our Milvis line of lenses, and especially our Otis line of lenses, is so high that people sometimes choose these lenses for cinema applications over our own really? cinema lenses. Really? Yes, absolutely. So the Otis, for example, there's only three focal lengths available on the Otis, 28, 55, and 85. So it's very limiting, because in cinema, you want to have as many as you want as possible. The Milvis, you have a whole line between 15 and 135. So it's much more conducive for video. Well, but the, the Otis aren't quite as fast as some of the cinema lenses, right? No, no, they're just as fast. Oh, okay, but there's not, is there a T2? Or is there uh, a T2 no, equipment? This is an F1 actually. Oh, it's a 1.4. F1.4. So in a T-stop, this T-stop measures to about T1.5 or T1.6 wow. approximately. So that's just as fast as our Supreme Primes. I mean, it's a different lens for sure, so it's going to have a different look. But it's for the price point, you're getting a good bang for the buck. Because if this was in a cinema application, if I had to put this in a cinema housing, it would be much more expensive because it's harder to develop like that, right? And this is a nice, heavy lens great optical quality. You're talking about $4,500 to $5,000 each. So this is some of the best lenses you can ever find for full frame still photography. So if you have a, a 5DS or a, a, you know, A9 from Sony that's a 42 megapixel and you want to have something with that kind of resolving power, you're looking at a lens like the Otis. But because it's also after chromat, meaning it has no chromatic aberration whatsoever, and it, you know, has some literally no chromatic aberration. All chromatic aberrations hidden within the soft autofocus part of the lens. So when you look at a highlight with this lens, you won't see a, a green or magenta ring around it. Uh, in a high contrast situation. It, it really is a very beautiful lens. But, so because of that, it rivals optically some of our highest quality cinema lenses. It might not be in the right format, like the right form, but it's a very, very good optics. You mean so, like the not form, same form factor? Correct, they're not the same form factor. Because as you know, cinema lenses are meant for purpose built to be used on set. So they have the perfect type of rings, the perfect throws, the construction, and just the way that they work. Like for example, in the CP3 line, almost all the lenses in the CP3 line are these exact same body style. So changing one focal length to another on a camera rig is very, very easy. You're not going to find the same thing in our still line, because the still lines, the lenses vary, the bodies vary quite a bit. How, why is it though, I'm just curious, without getting too much in the weeds, why is it that somebody might opt for, for an Otis lens versus a cinema lens? If, if, the, if the glass rival and the form factor is a little more difficult to, to manage, having to add on rings and whatever. Well, cinema's all about looks. And all these different lens lies do have slightly different looks. And with those slight changes in looks, it makes a difference for a cinematographer. So depending on the kind of project that they have, maybe if they have a project that's sci-fi, maybe they want a more cleaner lens that's more neutral so that they don't have the colors falling one way or the other. But sometimes if you have a dramatic series, you might want something with more character. And the nice thing about some of our still lenses is they give you really beautiful character. So good bang for the buck, you know? You maybe can't achieve that look with a certain type of cinema lens. Or you just don't have the budget. So this rivals some of our competition cinema lenses that are three times the price in terms of the optical quality. But again, limited in focal length, right? So you only have three focal lengths. And also, it is a, it's a still lens, so you have to deal with that when you're on set. But looking forward, we see that a lot of uh, people that you were talking about this hybrid space that shoot photography that are getting into video, what we're telling them is like, this is perfect for you because you buy one lens and you could actually use it for both applications really, really well. So for them, it's a no-brainer. They don't want to use a cinema lens for photography. 
they want to use a photo lens. So for them, if you're able to cinematize it, it makes a lot of sense. And then for some select cinematographers that just want a different look, they love Zeiss lenses, but they just want a different look. I'm like, all right, well, try all the lenses, you know? I mean, just don't stick to just the high-end stuff from cinema. Try everything and see what you like, because you never know. So there is a wide variety of user base. Of course, if I go to anything over a $5 million budget, I'm almost never going to see a still lens on a camera unless it's a specialty like a drone shot or something like that. But for anything less than that or short form projects or even you know low budget commercials or music videos, especially music videos, which nowadays have no budget whatsoever, why not use the same lens that you're using on your still camera? Save some money, right? This one lens is compatible with every Canon mount out there. That's EF, every full frame mount. So that means it's on the 5D, the C300, the C200, the C100, the C500, C700. Or if I go to another manufacturer, I could put this on a RED, a Mini, Alexa Mini, an Alexa Mira, I'm sorry, Area Mira. There's so many different cameras you could put it on. And they all have this ability to use the Canon EF mount. So you have versatility with your lenses. So for the cinema world, versatility is important, choice is important. For the photo world, compatibility is important. So this lens is compatible with your still camera and any video system out there too, right now. So really, you know, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good investment because you're gonna use it a lot. And what we try to do is we try to give a lot of training and videos and things like that online for photographers to be able to transition into doing video as well. And I'll tell you one thing that's really important that photographers understand right away, I think it's very easy to, to see why, they understand the need for a manual focus lens once they start doing video. You can't do autofocus with video, it just doesn't work, I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So then you, they see the benefits of it. So there's also that as well. A lot of still photographers are learning that as they do video, that you know, there is something you have to take into consideration, other than auto, especially autofocus. Absolutely, I mean, in the days of the ZEZF Primes, I used to teach a workshop for Canon cameras on how to exploit them for video. And right away, the first thing, even back then, we were talking about is, you need to write, use the right lens. You need to use an appropriate lens. So the beautiful thing about our cinema line is that it's compatible with everything. Just like I said that we have photo lenses, purpose-built for Canon or Nikon that you could use for video, the, the really nice thing about all of our cinema lenses is that we do maximum compatibility there as well. So here I'm holding a lens that actually has an EF mount. So I'm able to change the mount on my CP3 lens, which is a nice, <clears throat> mid-range, good quality, cinema prime lens, I'm able to change the mount to whatever I want. So I can go from PL mount to EF to E mount for Sony, F mount for Nikon, and then I could use this on various bodies as well. So we're always trying to do the maximum compatibility. And in fact, CP lenses were very, very popular. The CP2 line, the previous line, was hugely successful. We have about 30,000 pieces plus of the CP1 and 2 lens lines out in the market right now. You can go to any country you want to and just yell in the wind, go, I want a set of CP2s and someone will come with the case because every rental house has one. So because of that, the compatibility that we have and being able to go on any camera system has pushed this lens into that kind of success level because you were able to use it on a 5D one day, next day change it out, use it on an Alexa, and the third day change it around, use it on a Sony E-mount FS7. So you have a lot of choices there too. And we do the same thing even with our high quality uh, cinema lines as well. But normally, of course, PL mount is the standard that everyone uses in the industry. And every one of our cinema lenses can come in PL. Great, that was really a great introduction. Thanks a lot, Stanhall, really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for coming by the booth. I'm Rich Schluning, Senior Director of the Americas for the Zeiss Camera Lens Division. Hey Rich, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So you've, uh, one of the few people, or possibly the only person we've spoken with who's shot with the 4D close focus. Yeah. Tell us about that lens. Tell us a little bit about the background of that interesting focal length. So I'm one of the lucky guys that when a new lens comes to Zeiss, uh, I don't let it go. So I was one of the fortunate ones to get a early production version of the 40 millimeter close focus lens. And uh, I have available to me literally every lens that Zeiss makes for Canon, Nikon, Fuji, Sony cameras. And my go-to focal length, uh, where I get my best images is 35 millimeter. It's my favorite lens by far. I, I go through my Flickr site and I'm looking at the images, the ones that really stand out to me are my 35 millimeter images. It'll, it's one focal length that allows me to do two things. I can get a wide shot, right? So as a prime, I'm zooming with my feet. 
Uh, I'm more engaged with my subject. I'm moving around, I'm trying different camera angles. Um, you know, I find that I get a bit lazy with the zoom. So Prime gets me just more active and, and engaged. And the other thing it allows me to do is get close. So 35 kind of is that wide kind of focal length that you would think that a moderate wide angle would do. But it also is it's a lens I can shoot like 12 inches. Now, when the 40 millimeter close focus was announced, right, and I saw the specs on it, 40 millimeter was uh, an unusual focal length, but close enough to a 35 that I was actually kind of encouraged and interested in using it. And it, it does a few things for me. Um, a 50 mil is, is a challenging lens to use because it really doesn't add a lot to a shot one way or the other. It's an important lens in the camera bag because of its normal kind of perspective. But in terms of adding a, a, a kind of a creative angle of view, it's a bit more challenging to work with. I find the 40 to be a, a blend of both, right? It's a moderate wide as, and also being a normal focal length lens. So I was able to kind of get my wide shots um, that I would typically use a 35 for and get also much tighter to the action to get a kind of a detailed close up. So that lens at you know, roughly you know, nine and a half, 10 inches close focus or wide open, you can get really creative with it. Uh, you're really focused only on a narrow slice of the image and your, your out of focus highlights, both front focus and back focus, take on a really nice smooth character. How does a, how does a, le you know, a new a lens offering, a new, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm not sure, is that a new focal length precise? as a prime? Yeah, I believe it is, yes. So how does that come about in the development stage? Do you, do you know about that? So, you know, we're looking at the available lenses for um, that camera platform, and we want to make sure that we have an offering that we think is going to be interesting to the customers out there. So, you know, there was already uh, Zeiss branded uh, 35 millimeter, 55 millimeter lenses. So we didn't want to, you know, we didn't look at those focal length and say, well, we didn't want to confuse the market by introducing a Zeiss only branded lens in the same focal length where there was already a Zeiss lens. In this case, the one sold by Sony. You know, it's Sony Zeiss branded lens. So the 40 millimeter is actually, you know, it was a deliberate uh, choice of having a lens that would do a bit of both. Still have a moderate wide and being kind of that normal focal length lens. Um, you know, wedding market is one of those areas we're targeting for the Bodice family. And so we, you know, we had the wide 18 and 25s. We're missing the focal lengths between 25 and 85. And we think the 40 kind of uh, fills a nice niche in that area. Well, you're one of the few that's used it. It's October, late October, 2018. When are people going to be able to actually get a hold of it? So it's shipped from the factory this week. <laughs> so it takes a couple weeks uh, in transit. Uh, we're expecting to start delivering to dealers by mid-November. So in their hands before Thanksgiving. Very timely. Yeah. Well, thanks for telling us about it. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Join us next week for another edition of Zeiss Presents Full Exposure. If you can't watch, you can always catch the audio-only version on iTunes and Spotify. Follow us on Instagram at Zeiss underscore Full Exposure or on the web at ZeissFullExposure.com. And to learn about the latest in Zeiss lenses, head to Zeiss.com. <laughs>